Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager, due diligence, or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I know how valuable your time is, so I appreciate you spending some of it here with me. And also thank you to those of you who are sharing the podcast with your friends and your colleagues. It really does help me to expand the reach of the show so that more people can learn from my amazing guests. On today's show, I'm talking to Arif Karim, founder and CEO of Quality Capital Management. Arif brings a unique perspective to our conversation as he started off his career on the buy side of the hedge fund industry. And not only that, he did it within the largest allocator to hedge funds at the time and perhaps even today, namely the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi, also known as ADIA. I think most people will learn a great deal from the insights to this unique organization that Arif shares. But I also want to mention that at the very end of our conversation, Arif surprised me when I asked him what I had not covered in the interview. I think his answer says a lot about his attitude towards transparency and the challenges that you face as a hedge fund manager. Now, for those of you who are new to the show, let me just mention that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode on the toptradersunplug.com website. Now, let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Arif, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Neil, for the invitation. You're very welcome. Now, you started QCM about 20 years ago, but it wasn't your first career choice, so to speak, um, because you started out as an accountant, if I'm not mistaken. But I think in fairness that it's the next move in your career that many people is fascinated about namely how you go from working as an accountant in the UK to joining one of, if not the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. And it wasn't just any sovereign wealth fund, it was ADIA. And this, I believe, has great relevance to our industry as a whole and to our listeners in particular, because ADIA has been known to be a very early adopter and a great supporter of the alternative investment strategies and perhaps in particular the systematic type trading strategies that would also include commodities in the investment universe. So naturally, I'm excited to be able to dive into this topic with you today because I think we can all learn from these experiences. Um, but of course, the transi transition from being on the buy side of the industry to then starting your own hedge fund is also quite unique. But I thought because you're on and you have such a long career in this industry that I wanted to start a slightly different place today, namely by asking you perhaps to give a historic perspective of the hedge fund industry or alternative investment industry from your point of view, looking at it over a 40 year plus period. Maybe you can share some of your insight as to how it was back in the day and, and how you've seen it evolve over time. Absolutely. Um, let me talk, to put things into perspective, let me talk a little bit about my sort of younger days and childhood, etc., but uh, very quickly. Sure. Um, so that kind of uh, has some bearing on 
um, the evolution, if you like, or the, the path essentially that I've taken uh, that has led up to uh, the industry I'm in today. Sure. So um, I, I come from a place which today is called Bangladesh, a country called Bangladesh, which is uh, for many years has been one of the um, sort of poorest countries in the world. Um, and it was formerly uh, known as East Pakistan. Um, in 1947, the British, uh, up, up until then, the British had ruled uh, United India and Pakistan was a part of it. Uh, and then in 1947, they got the independence. And my father, uh, I'm, I'm the youngest of a family of 10. Right. Uh, and it's <laughs> much like a Catholic family, if you like, in the sure. West, you know, very spiritual parents, but, uh, but on the other hand, fairly liberal. And uh, he had his own struggles coming from a village, uh, made it into the civil service, uh, um, educated himself, went all the way through to university, um, and then joined the British government. Mm -hmm. um, and he worked up the ranks and uh, eventually became a senior officer in the government of Bengal under the British rule uh, until 1947. So I wasn't born then. I was born, of course, in 1953, a few years later. Uh, but the childhood was a very modest one. But it was a lot of fun, mm. uh, mainly outdoors, growing up with very basic kind of um, sporting kit, if you like, from playing football. And because it was under the rule of the British, so cricket was very popular too. Uh, and on the other hand, flying kites and playing with um, uh, tops and marbles and things like that. It was very much outdoorsy kind of uh, life. Sure. Uh, but my father sort of uh, placed a high degree of importance uh, to education. And he wanted... Uh, to make sure that all 10 of the children eventually went to university right. um, because he had gone through his experiences and he found how uh, beneficial it was in terms of his own career. Mm -hmm. the, his income was very modest, but nevertheless, he managed to put me into a private school, which was uh, an American school, ironically enough. Uh, okay. These American missionary schools, uh, St. <laughs> Joseph's, I still remember. Um, and uh, I, I went through the schooling uh, there um, and then eventually went from there to college uh, uh, for another two years. This is the pre-university kind of um, sure. uh, degree, that secondary education. Uh, and that too was with a convent kind of uh, American college, it's Notre Dame. Okay. Now, my focus at the time was very much into uh, the sciences, uh, physics, chemistry, maths, and so on and so forth. And what had happened was um, I had four brothers, or three other brothers, including myself, and my mm -hmm. eldest brother uh, eventually became quite successful after joining the army. And he went to, you know, Sanders in the UK, he went to West Point in the US, he joined the Armored Corps, he became eventually a general. Okay. My second brother went on to do um, uh, advertising and built up the largest advertising company uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and then my third brother went into civil service and he almost became a governor. So each of, the, each of my uh, three brothers um, had been very successful in their own right. Mm. And my father quite fancied me to be joining the foreign service. To, he he <laughs> thought I could make a good foreign minister or, or an ambassador for the country. Okay. The focus of my education kind of changed a bit because I was in two minds that uh, when you're young, of course, you think, oh, I'm going to, my brother's joined the, the <laughs> army, so I'm going to go into uh, the Air Force. Right. So I was fascinated with aircraft, etc., jet aircraft in particular. And I used to build some model planes and such like, so I was quite, uh, quite into that. Sure. But um, uh, having said that, when my father ruled that out, said, look, I think you should go somewhere else. And, you know, you do have a lot of um, influence, paternal influence, particularly in those days. You know, when you have large families, the father is the father figure. Right. I mean, right. He is the one who kind of almost uh, tells you what to do type of thing. Sure. Uh, within giving you certain allowances, of course. So he... Um, uh, suggested that I join the Foreign Service, but then uh, the war broke out. And in between, I was thinking, like, perhaps I'll do architecture. So in some ways, English as a language fascinated me. Mm -hmm. So that um, I thought, okay, if I'm going to go into the Foreign Service, okay, then perhaps I would rather prefer to do it through 
uh, English as a language because you didn't need to have the sciences to, to join the foreign service. Right. Um, so I basically uh, uh, suggested that to my father and he said, uh, okay, if that's what takes your fancy. So essentially from the science, uh, science uh, curriculum that I was following in college, as I went to university, I switched to English, English okay. literature, and I did English and economics at university. And that was the time when the war of independence, effectively, and I'm now talking about the independence of Bangladesh, um, started. Okay. And uh, so the university closed down because it was all total disruption there. Mm. And I um, uh, essentially uh, decided that to continue my education, I would move to West Pakistan, which is the other wing, mm -hmm. uh, into Karachi and uh, finish my university degree there. So I finished that in Karachi and uh, I went on uh, to be in the first year doing my master's. And that was the time when I got a break to leave essentially the country because, um, you know, war was going on. So it was very difficult to, um, uh, as, as a Bangladeshi, it was very difficult for because we were the seen to be the secessionists. Right, know. right. So we weren't uh, allowed to, you know, uh, leave the country. Anyhow, so I managed to essentially get uh, a special permission through some people I knew who helped me, etc. And I came to England, not mm -hmm. knowing exactly what I was going to do. I could not go back to Bangladesh because there was a lot of trouble there. Sure. Um, and that is when uh, I fell into accountancy because I found that to be a, a good, solid kind of professional career mm -hmm. and uh, that is uh, very reputable, respectable. Sure. And uh, my father and my family essentially thought that was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I started doing my chartered accountancy and I hated it initially <laughs> because <laughs> coming from the art world, having done literature, etc., you know, uh, so uh, nevertheless, I persevered because uh, it was a long four-year sort of um, uh, training period that you have to do and you have to do these professional educations. It's a bit like these days you do CFA, etc. So ours was a longer course, but something similar. Sure. And where whilst you are training, you actually, or whilst you are studying, basically you're also training with a firm. So you're attached to a firm. Okay. So anyhow, I, I qualified uh, from there, and then I was uh, I joined the um, the profession so with a firm of accountants. I quite by the time I finished, I quite actually enjoyed doing the accountancy <laughs> because what it brought uh, into perspective for me was this kind of ability to see the bigger picture when you're looking at corporate balance sheets and group balance sheets, and when you do consolidated kind of accounts and such like. It was, it was fascinating that you're able to go kind of macro and then zoom in and go into micro kind of aspects of, mm. a, of a company's operations, uh, analyzing it to, you know, to the T and, um, uh, and being able to make uh, recommendations, etc. At the same time, the whole operations element as well in terms of internal controls and such like, uh, those are also quite, um, quite fascinating. Sure. Um, and so my take away from the accountancy world is something which I feel is very, very uh, kind of important. And what has also been extremely beneficial for me is, I believe in my mind, to have done the arts degrees, you know. Mm -hmm. So today, you know, when somebody asks me, what are your hobbies, interests, I'm, I'm into photography, you know, uh, whether we talk about Ansel Adams, or the pictures of the black and white, large format of the Yosemite Valley or Henri Cartier-Bresson with his uh, photojournalism and that kind of stuff that sure. he did. Um, Yusuf Karsh was an Armenian Tur Turkish guy who did all the portraits and black and white of Churchill and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, and to all the way through to current day, Annie Leibovitz with, with Vanity Fair and such like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, you know, literature from poetry to fiction, whether we're talking about, you know, magical realism, you know, Salman Rushdie or Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, these are all kind of very uh, interesting for me. Sure. And, uh, you know, even today as we run our kind of strategies in, in the systematic world, um, I think that these, uh, the, the ability to be able to think left side, right side, and I keep telling 
most of my team members here as well, that this is absolutely crucial. Mm. Uh, because to be able to analyze and to be able to use your scientific sort of, you know, uh, uh, skill sets and knowledge that you picked up, but to be able to be creative at the same time is extremely kind of uh, important. Yeah. So whilst I was in the accountancy profession here, um, I had an opportunity, um, funnily enough, uh, to go to Abu Dhabi on my way to uh, Dhaka, to Bangladesh, on a holiday, um, only because a sister of mine happened to be living in Abu Dhabi. She was married to an engineer, a uh, husband of hers, who sadly passed some years ago. And um, he was working for an oil company. And uh, so they basically said, look, you know, you've never been to Abu Dhabi, come visit us, you mm. know. So I said, okay, why not? <laughs> so when I was passing through Abu Dhabi, I spent a few days, and I thought, you know what? This is actually quite a nice place, you know. It's, uh, the money was tax-free, etc. Sure. And not just that, but the place was actually, the standard was quite livable. Of course, you didn't have all the facilities, etc. but you could kind of be able to sort of go away as and when you needed mm -hmm. and get your batteries kind of recharged if you like. Sure. And at that time, of course, Abu Dhabi was not as developed as it is uh, today. Right. Uh, anyhow, this, this opportunity came up with, uh, with Adia. And, and so I joined uh, this uh, institution. They made me an offer. And it was initially in the financial management side. But what right. I found was that uh, and I'm now talking about 1982. Uh, sure. My first um, daughter, I've got three children. My first was uh, uh, just about a year old, in fact. Uh, she currently works with me here okay. on the business development side. So uh, I started at, uh, at Adi on the financial management side. And at the time, the institution did not have an alternative investment portfolio. What it did have was just a commodity portfolio. Uh, and by that, I mean they were holding passively quite a substantial reserve in terms of gold, like most central banks tend to do. Uh, and they wanted to develop uh, another sort of non-correlated uh, investment vehicle, if you like, within the institution because a large part of their assets were in classical sort of traditional equities, fixed income kind of things, and plus some real estate. My uh, boss at the time, the director, he to whom I reported uh, directly, he was a very interesting man, and uh, he was very encouraging, you know. I mean, I have to say in Abu Dhabi, I met some very nice people, uh, and within Adia as well, wonderful sure. people, sure. Uh, with whom I still maintain a good relationship. And um, and so they were very encouraging. My boss, Ubaid al at the time, he was very encouraging uh, for me to... I guess he must have seen the potential of me uh, sort of being more useful, if you like, on the investment side. And so without even realizing, I got more and more involved onto the investment side. And that led me on to the, the, this project, if you like, of um, starting up an alternative investment portfolio. Um, now, the difficulty was that there was already, of course, a substantial amount of investment in traditional assets into equities, fixed income, as I mentioned earlier. And so uh, we could not touch that. And hence, the alternative was to go through futures. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, and at the time, in fact, just prior, quite a few, quite a few years prior to that, um, uh, if you remember John Lindner, the late uh, sure. professor at Harvard, he sure. wrote uh, one of those pioneering books on managed futures and CTAs and so on and so forth, and um, uh, managed futures as an asset class almost, as he described at the time. And he did the typical efficient frontier study to show that what was an optimal allocation, I, and if I recall, I think it was something in the region of 30% or so that it made sense. Sure. Of course, when you have substantial, uh, substantially deep pockets, as Adia does, you know, to... Uh, with, with, with an industry, um, as in managed futures industry, being so tiny at the time, sure. that it was almost impossible to put any uh, substantial investment with any one manager. So, because most of them, I think, the, probably the largest CTA at the time uh, was um, Mann's uh, Mint. Uh, 
trying to mint, exactly. Yep. Yep. I was trying to think of what his name was. <laughs> mint with uh, Peter Matthews and... Uh, Larry Height. Larry Height yeah. and, uh, and Michael Delman, that's right. So they were managing, if I recall, something like 500 to 600 million at the time. Okay. And there were some other... Uh, managers uh, who were in the region of maybe 100 to 200 million mark. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, our um, mandate, therefore, was to see if we could uh, invest uh, with some of these uh, uh, managers that were non-correlated to the traditional asset class. So they wanted basically some active strategies. And so uh, with, with a universe that was relatively small at the time, um, and having seen the 87 stock market crash, it became even, in some respects, it became even more important for the institution to, to diversify. And right. they wanted some form of a kind of a hedge, I guess. Not that you could hedge with uh, such a small portfolio in relation to such a substantive uh, mainstream portfolio that they sure. were running. You know? sure. So... Obviously, I mean, without going into too much detail, because, you know, it is uh, an institution that um, is very discreet and one of the most um, enjoyable things about um, IDEA was the, was the sheer power and the understated way it operated. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, it had a lot of clout, but at the same time, it never flashed the clout. So mm -hmm. that was really nice. Um, so anyhow, we went around very discreetly to try and sort of, um, and I was kind of, driving that process to a certain extent uh, in terms of finding or identifying um, managers and CTAs. We were tough in our negotiations in terms of fees <laughs> and, and simply yes. because it was a sovereign fund. They were obviously not used to seeing these large management fees. In those days, if you recall, the you know, fees were like 6% as Mint used <laughs> to charge, 6 and 15, I think it was. Sure. Uh, and even subsequently, you know, the fees were typical at 4 or 5, you know, and 15 to 20. Sure. This was just simply unheard of, you know. Uh, sure. So we had to do some very innovative kind of uh, negotiated uh, you know, um, fee structures that I came up with uh, to be able to um, uh, symbiotically, you know, benefit both sides. So, uh, for, from their perspective, the big selling point for us, uh, and, and uh, it was was basically that uh, look, this is high quality money. Uh, we're very discreet; you cannot disclose name, etc. Uh, but this is very long term relationships that we're looking to build, and so on and so forth. Sure. So, uh, and that kind of worked. And so, the industry in those days, uh, to go back to your original question yep. was that um, it was dominated by in the futures area by trend followers okay um, now there were some variations like for example uh, Paul Tudor Jones who had a cracking year in 87 you know and uh, had the limelights there uh, with his 120 percent I think returns if I recall the number to be right sure um, wow so um, he was doing a little bit of technical trading, swing trading, and so on and so forth. Um, but predominantly, trends dominated things. And markets were so inefficient in those days that you could literally you know, ride these trends for extended periods of time. And mm. so... Uh, and, and most of the CTAs did very adopted a very linear kind of approach, and that is to say, market by market, they had technical signals of some sort, and then uh, you just essentially write out those larger trends. Uh, in particular, even in currencies, I remember that you had some major, major trends. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and obviously, this is pre, you know, uh, EC and so on and so forth. Yeah. The evolution of the industry over the years has been incredible. Um, I mean, for a start, the uh, what started out initially quite a bit in the U.S. I mean, U.S. CTAs were a lot more in 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 in, in terms of numbers sure. compared to European. And you had in Europe primarily, I think it was just primarily Mint was the only one um, that was well known at the time. You know. Sure. And what you saw was a gradual kind of uh, almost. Uh, diffusion from the U.S., or migration, if you like, in terms of the talent side of it, into Europe, and uh, in particular, UK as well. You yeah. know? And 
from uh, from an investor perspective, from audio perspective, it was great, not just geographically, but I mean, it meant like there was uh, an evolution in terms of the approach so that the typical trend following linear approach of market by market type of thing with traditional stops and so on and so forth and just uh, you know diversifying across multiple time frames um, that approach started to change so at some point uh, the risk allocation um, aspect of fund management if you like uh, started to progress mm. and uh, and uh, this then took us into kind of you know various portfolio methods whereby it wasn't just the signals but it was how you allocated the your risk budget to different markets and so some variations of you know the traditional market with its mean variance approach uh, and 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 you know variations of those so in in some ways the degree of sophistication also um, increased manifold yeah because of technology, uh, the power of computers, the power of being able to go into tighter time frames, shorter time frames. Mm. Uh, not that I'm a great believer in, in that, but sure. I mean, that's just a philosophical thing. Sure. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that allowed a lot more diversity. Uh, and with that came uh, the ability to build uh, portfolios or, or approaches that were much uh, quicker in terms of frequency, so higher frequency. And with all the low latency stuff that's out uh, today, it's even more so. Yeah. And also variations in the stra strategies. So what used to be almost, uh, you know, a one, one model or one type of approach, basically through trends, started to uh, morph into um, multi-strat type of things. You know, mm. so you had uh, uh, essentially mean reversionary type of approaches built in, along with uh, along with um, uh, trend models. You know. mm. And, uh, and, and so, anyhow, I mean, basically, this uh, allowed the audio portfolio for us to kind of build on it. And, and I certainly was never a great believer in, uh, in huge amount of diversification. Uh, so, we kept the numbers to a manageable level, not mm -hmm. too many. Sure. Um, and I also was a great believer in taking on uh, some degree of volatility because anybody who was just, you know, smoothing away the vol uh, was essentially, for me, smooth and you know, taking away the skew potential right. of the strategy. Right. And at our idea as a sovereign fund, you know, obviously we could stomach some volatility so long as at a portfolio level you can just cancel them out, you know, yeah. which is what we were and That was our job, right? So um, our preference was not necessarily to, at the time I'm talking about, of sure. course, Sure. change now was not necessary to go with um, traders who were so particular about controlling vol and so on and so forth uh, that their returns were kind of meager so we essentially wanted more you know a little bit of spicier kind of uh, <laughs> managers but there was quite a diversity of, uh, of of these now of course a lot of these managers over the years the successful ones uh, who built on the business and built it uh, built them up to sizable businesses uh, today um, have um, changed their methods so that uh, and, and this is um, something that everybody knows about sure. that uh, that uh, there, there has been a degree of style drift call it evolution or whatever um, so that um, you know research has led them into trying to focus a lot more on the risk side and and in the process uh, also uh, the returns have um, kind of um, diluted somewhat from from the punchier returns that we used to get so that's kind of the the, the, the sort of evolution uh, idea. And then I had a, a personal sort of setback. My wife kind of unexpectedly passed uh, uh, back in 95, uh, sorry, 92 rather. And uh, and so I had three young children at the time. And so uh, two, of the, two of the others were born actually there. My original plan of um, uh, wanting to come back to the UK, which is where I was based, uh, got delayed to a certain extent uh, simply because there was, this was such a major upheaval in my personal life, you know. Um, so I needed time. I didn't want to, uh, to introduce other variables in terms of uh, complicating my life. So I stayed on for another couple of years. My 
boss at the time. He was um, he really wanted me to stay on. Sure. So anyhow, uh, it worked out okay. It was fine. Then I left in '95, and I knew kind of pretty much what I was going to do. At one time, I thought, okay, should I go into the fund of funds sort of side of things because that's where obviously a lot of my experience was. Sure. But then I had already started to kind of do bits and pieces on modeling and stuff, and so. Um, in '95, when I came back, I decided that um, I was going to found my own business, uh, which was going to be a CTA business, uh, primarily starting off with futures. And hence, um, thus QCM was born in '95, uh, um, uh, December of '95. We started trading with some uh, friends and family money and probably one of my first investors was um, a commodities corp at the time was uh, seeding some of the you know uh, smaller CTAs you know starting off and so they also seeded us so that was the that was basically uh, the start i'd already developed a, a model which was a relatively straightforward simple um, trend following model um, and uh, the initially the number of markets we were covering were just the U.S. markets, so there were about 25 of those. And yeah, and there we go. And then uh, thus unfolds the QCM story. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. That's you know. Thank you so much for sharing that. I I wanted to ask you something before we leave the the Adia story, which I think is is quite uh, it, you know, to me at least. I'm curious about it. Yes. Back in the day, how did you get comfortable? with a manager because and, and and my perspective here is nowadays for an institution to make an investment with a manager you have to look like an institution and you have to have quite a big infrastructure and all of these things that basically prevents allocators today to invest with small managers but yes. back in the day when i'm thinking that things were not as uh, organized and some of these managers who obviously built billion dollar businesses today i'm sure they they weren't quite there at that time so how did what were you looking for what was important to you in evaluating a manager back then okay i mean no that's a good, a good question um so essentially um the instruments we were trading gave us huge comfort futures okay because as you know with futures everybody's talks about these days, particularly after the 2008 crisis, about all the transparency and liquidity and so on and so forth. We recognized that years ago at the time. Yeah. Uh, and not just that, but it was a fundamental to our hedge fund portfolio uh, build, uh, build, if you like, you sure. know, uh, because uh, we had to convince our investment committee that these were highly liquid. If we didn't like it, we could get out any time. Not that that was our intention because it's a sovereign fund. It was a very much a long-term strategic kind of uh, portfolio. So the first comfort was purely from the fact that these are regulated um, markets, uh, the futures, and one price for all transactions sure. costs, even though those days, um, you know, brokers did charge quite a high <laughs> level of commission. <laughs> But still, it was it was good. The fact that we did not have to fund the entire uh, investment, so that you know you could almost uh, we used it as like a, like a, at one time like almost like an overlay strategy. So you could put in the margin amounts. We had um, uh, completely separate, segregated sort of uh, accounts uh, with um, uh, top-notch banks. Uh, mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure, essentially, that from an operational perspective and from a credit perspective, we were fully covered. Mm -hmm. So that meant that uh, the next thing to kind of uh, uh, really be more concerned about was the, the strategy element. On the strategy side, uh, what we wanted was consistency. This was very crucial, at least for me, it was very crucial. Sure. Uh, we did not like uh, managers that were constantly changing and swapping their um, strategies and kind of more models and so on and so forth. And so much so that we used to have clauses in our agreements that um, if uh, any changes in the models are uh, to be made or made, then we should be, you know, Consulted first, or we should be informed. Actually, um, I remember that actually. <laughs> yeah. So this this was kind of quite pivotal because what we didn't want is this business of style drift, particularly because remember not all of them had very long history either, right? Right. 
and, and then the second thing is that what he, we did not want was this uh, 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 risk of style drift. Sure. So then the bonus came, obviously, in terms of identifying managers who did have some infrastructure, operational infrastructure on mm -hmm. top. Mm -hmm. um, so those were like, you know, getting uh, a bigger sort of ticks, if you like, in the boxes. You know? <laughs> um, so you were using a tick box system even then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, have, but having said that, you know, it was, it was really more important that the team as a whole, the, the, their backgrounds and their kind of, you know, the strategies all made sense. Mm. We also wanted quite a bit of transparency in terms of strategies. And we have always said that, look, it's not our intention to try and copy this, et cetera. Or in any way whatsoever, but uh, we need to understand because if we don't understand, we're not going to be with you when you go through these uh, uh, difficult times, you yeah. know, through drawdowns and so on and so forth. And and in fact, they did offer a huge amount of transparency. Not mm -hmm. that there was a great deal of you know variations or differences between managers, because you know the bulk of them really were sort of following trends, really. Sure, then, you sure. know, so. Uh, so there was such an overlap to a certain extent. Uh, it was mainly it mainly came about through time frames, and perhaps the portfolios were a little bit different. Um, but of course, as time uh, moved on, then you know we started to get a lot more sophistication. Mm. And uh, at the same time, we kind of uh, towards my last few years, um, we started to move not away i should say the bulk of it was still trend following and kind of ctas but we started to venture into other kind of uh, uh, approaches or strategies mm -hmm. uh, so we took on some guys who were doing global or tactical asset allocation with multi-factor models uh, we took on we never took on any at the time any uh, shorter term high frequency guys because mind you those if, even the level of sophistication was not there that much because technology was not uh, that far advanced sure, sure. I mean, it was advancing which hadn't uh, reached quite the stage that we felt comfortable with mm -hmm. um, Yeah, and then we went into currency specialists and, and so on and so So, you know, the job became, in some ways, a lot more challenging to find and uh, to identify kind of strategies and um, uh, approaches that were uh, quite a bit different from just what we were already doing. That was our bread and butter, yeah. which was the CTA kind of yeah. side. Yeah. And in so doing, uh, with some of the global TA guys, these were some of the larger kind of uh, fund managers who were venturing into, and they had really fine uh, people working, great brains, and so on and so forth. And they were, you know, in, in a way, testing out uh, their kind of approaches and the models uh, using futures to uh, essentially trade equity index futures and fixed income and currencies and so on and so forth, and primarily sticking to Uh, financial markets and not so much commodities um, and and we did identify a number of those and so we uh, invested with them so the portfolio uh, overall then kind of um, uh, morphed into a combination of uh, uh, CTAs and other strategies let's say okay. um, so that that was uh, I don't know if I've answered your question no no that's very interesting and so so we're now in 1995 you're you're heading back to the UK and you're starting a QCM but what would you say those 13 years at Adia what what is the one really important thing you brought back with you that was very important to you in starting QCM um I think in, in line with uh, my accountancy background that I kind of ref referred to earlier sure. in terms of being able to see the macro picture and so on and so forth, what really helped and complemented that was essentially my tenure at Adia because they were also the big picture kind of yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, looking beyond the noise, looking at the bigger kind of bigger things, bigger relationships in terms of markets. Um, and that almost takes you a little bit towards a philosophy that abhors and sort of moves away from anything that is too, where there's just too many things going on. Right, that, right, right, okay. right. So in other words, simplicity, robustness, you know, some of the basic things that are fundamental to our philosophy at QCM, uh, because I believed in those, and this is still 
you know, prevails today. It hasn't sure. changed. So I just did not believe in uh, too many moving parts sort of coming into the equation because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of smoke without the fire, essentially, mm -hmm. and too many competing kind of uh, forces. Um, so whilst I was at IDEA, keeping the portfolio relatively straightforward, simple, etc., and which did very well mm -hmm. uh, during my period, and I'm sure it continues to do so now, I kind of, you know, used that philosophy almost to be... Uh, developing our own sort of strategies here. Uh, and I referred earlier to the left side, right side, and the hobbies and interests. And, you know, uh, we want to encourage creativity, but at the same time, it's not creativity for the sake of creativity in the sense that, you know, you don't want to just tinker with things all the time. You sure. know? So what we've been able to to try and focus on, you know, is is really what are the main sources of returns. Where's the real alpha coming from? Uh, and I'm a great believer that it all comes from more the portfolio approach. And I know there's a number of uh, managers out there who uh, essentially take a very linear approach of doing market by market and they feel like if they've got the best model in a certain market or a certain sector asset class um, that that is where their alpha comes from. Uh, I, I'd kind of take a view that you know the less indicators we use um, and uh, and the more portfolio relationships that we kind of you know track and and, and to, to move positions around and so mm -hmm. on and so forth uh, is a lot more uh, beneficial so in other words kind of asset allocation if you like uh, although in our kind of shorter term or relatively shorter term uh, approach as opposed to long-term asset allocation from an institutional perspective sure, yeah. higher portfolio level is, is probably more uh, what we what would be like risk allocation but tactical it's a dynamic risk allocation and I, I, I do believe that uh, a lot of alpha comes from there rather than trying to sort of feed you know, um get the signals right to be able to call the directions right, you know, whether it should be long or, or, or short. But was that a focus from the beginning? Because you mentioned earlier that you kind of started out as a CTA. And my yes. impression is that you maybe morphed yourself actually into more of that, Absolutely. you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, that's 100% right, because I started off as a, as a CTA. And then I realized that the keeping kind of static views on markets in terms of weights and allocations and such like uh, was not the most efficient way of mm -hmm. going about doing the job. So we said, okay, we have to make this a bit more dynamic and have some limits within each you know, well, obviously within markets, but also within each uh, sector, if you like. Um, and uh, but, however, allow it to kind of um, float a little bit in terms of the weights and so on and so forth. Um, and and that uh, uh, approach, to me, kind of tied uh, um, or, or linked in our philosophy and everything. It kind of blended nicely with the basic economic rationale that we are after. Uh, and, and, and that has not changed in any way. The, the basic uh, interests, economic sort of, you know, um, changes of the economic paradigms, if you like, the inflation, deflation themes that kind of pan out. Now, you may say, okay, well, you know, if you just do trend following, you can do that too. You do, but accepting you're doing it singularly, market by market. And that, to me, is less efficient than to be able to say, okay, how do stocks and bonds kind of relate to each other during different changes of um, uh, economic regimes, you know, and um, uh, that opens up another dimension completely. Uh, and I believe that there is greater alpha in that mm. than, rather than just, you know, uh, through trying to linearly um, get the direction right. So absolutely 100% that, yes, our strategy has evolved. And I would say that probably uh, in 2005 was our first uh, kind of major change in direction, although it's kind of, I, I say 2005, because you can't really put exact <laughs> time frame on it because, you know, these things evolve, sure, right? Sure. But I would say 2000, by, by 2005, we had kind of almost switched completely into a dynamic allocation approach, but still using some uh, indicators for uh, directional calls. And that we 
phased out slowly over a period from, you know, multiple 6-8 indicators to, you know, uh, down to 3, then down to 1, then now to today, I mean, we don't use any indicators whatsoever, you know, so there's not any indicators. And um, I, I'm very excited. I love what we do and, and, and w how we've evolved to what we have evolved because I do believe that this um, is a kind of a quite a potent uh, strategy. Uh, obviously, I know we've all gone through some hard times uh, in the last three years or so, sure, sure. but I think that what we have done to our models in terms of the slight uh, enhancements that we made you know, made them a lot more significantly more powerful so that you know, they're able to, the strategies of the models are able to handle unencountered kind of environments such as what we've seen in the last few years a lot more efficiently, a lot more better. You know, of course, time will tell. But, but the good thing is there's no fitting in this. Sure, sure. You know, we've never had to, I mean, this is something I, by the way, I adopted right from the beginning is that even when we were trend followers, it was the same uh, input, same parameter that was used across all markets. In other words, what I was really after philosophically was more the strategy and not the market itself, you know, mm. uh, which is quite an important thing from, from my perspective, uh, because if you believe that you've got a good sound strategy, then all these things go up and down. So, you know, you should be able to kind of make, uh, but of course, there are certain nuances that you can uh, kind of take advantage of, but that can come later. You know, you can add certain things to take into account those sort of things. But at the base level, you know, I think it's quite important that uh, markets should be seen in a very generic way, almost in a similar kind of way. You know? Sure. You know, I want to try and see if we can visualize this a little bit because, uh, you know, even for me, these things can sometimes be uh, quite difficult to, uh, to sort of follow. So let me start out with how... I think, in a sense, you 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 started off, and 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 like many trend followers, so essentially, you could have a model that you test across all types of markets, and let's just say that you buy the 50-day high and you sell the 50-day low, and you use some kind of risk management overlay to to that. You could have other models using moving average uh, crossover systems. It doesn't really matter. So that's one way of capturing trends. Now. How do, how if you should describe visually what your what your model evolved into, and what are the things that you're looking for, and how do you systematize that? How how would you describe that? Okay, so I mean, if we think about returns, alpha, you know, essentially can come from um, a couple of sources. The third source is really more market return, market moves, if you like, but that you don't have any control over. But what you do have control over is essentially the direction, okay? Mm -hmm. So whether you're long or short, that's mm -hmm. up to you. And the level of conviction that you put on a trade, okay? So the weight, if you like, that sure. you put into it. Um, and you can vary both of those, right? Now, when we started off, we focused a lot more on trying to find the best way to call the directions, right? Mm -hmm. And we essentially diversified that, recognizing that, uh, you know, uh, we could be out of sync in, the, in, the, in terms of the cycles, um, uh, of of the trends. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've had a shorter term, medium term, and longer term, which is kind of quite typical, I guess, uh, for most um, CTAs. Mm -hmm. And the second variable of changing the weights, we kept that almost at a constant. So we would vol adjust them in terms of the position size, sure. right? Sure. Uh, which is just an explicit kind of adjustment from pure changes in volatility, but we would keep the weight, the risk weight, uh, almost a static on a market-to-market mm -hmm. market basis. And a lot of CTAs still continue to do that, and it works, sure. by the way. It's, it's, if you like, it's the, you know, it's the heuristic kind of approach, you mm -hmm. know, you know, a rule of thumb type of thing. Okay, I put X, and some would say, okay, just equally weight on yeah. the markets, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that still works. I mean, you know, there's nothing kind of wrong with that. But no. we found that the errors that you engage into when you get the signal wrong and then you try and take care of those errors, you try and correct those errors, um, whether you do it through 
explicit kind of stops or whether you have another model which is a bit of shorter term to cancel the other one mm-hmm. um, to to um, kind of take off the position size fairly quickly that those errors are a lot more difficult to handle now it's all hunky dory when things are trends are really mm-hmm. going well it's not sure. a problem but when you get into troubled periods uh, I think that becomes a, a, bit, a bit of a challenge because what you end up with is a lot of um, you know errors uh, in terms of through the noise whipsaw errors sure. and these tend to compound and you get stuck in it you know a uh, long time so then we said okay in which case how about changing the weights right so mm. that when you're going into a problem area Let's not, uh, I mean, let's have the diversified uh, time frame approach in terms to, to help you out um, so that you're not engaging in unnecessarily kind of um, a high degree of activity. But at the same time, what if you were to reduce the weight there and shift that weight somewhere else? Okay, so that's sure. playing with that second variable. Sure. Now, you know, most managers, uh, most strategies today tend to focus, uh, I guess, I'm assuming, uh, just by feel and just by sure. looking at numbers, etc. Sure. that they play with both, okay? Yeah. In other words, they're playing with the uh, diversity of signal generators, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and at the same time, they're playing with allocation weight. Uh, now, the problem is you're therefore having two moving parts, you know? And, and, and this is the issue that, you know, the more, uh, you know, variables you introduce, uh, the more that things can go wrong, can go out of sync. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So you have to control that in a certain way, right? The signal generation part is a little bit more controllable because it tends to stick for a bit. I mean, mm. unless if you're a real high frequency uh, trader. So in our case, what we have done, the approach we've taken is almost eliminated the signal side of it. Okay, okay, the binary, you know, <laughs> long, short element of it. Right. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One is markets, uh, you know, uh, in terms of return generation process, are overwhelmingly uh, more profitable on the long side. Yes. Okay. And this is, this is you know, a no-brainer. I mean, uh, anybody can see that, that, you know, the markets are flawed. There's a logic behind it. They're flawed at zero. Uh, theoretically, upside is infinite. There's risk premium built into, the, into some of these assets. Um, so our propensity to buy is a far greater than our propensity to sell. Sure. Okay? Um, and this always keeps that um, um, element of buoyancy on the long side. Um, so that being so, that's being the case. So therefore, the need to change signals, long, short, long, short, etc., mm. is perhaps not as great in our minds as is the uh, need to be able to have some control on the dynamics of the weight shifts. Because mm. through the weight shifts, you can actually look at relationships, you know, between risk assets and non-risk assets. So where does this money flow, essentially, when risk is coming off? Where is this money flowing to? It's clearly going into some form of defensive asset, right? Mm. Non-risk, whether it's in the shorter end of the maturity spectrum into cash or whether we're going into the middle or whether we're going to some, some kind of longer term fixed income. Uh, that's another issue. But nevertheless, it will be somewhere there in the defensive area. Mm. So, what I'm trying to suggest here is that the ability to play correlations, and I'm not talking about explicit, like not a, a statistical kind of correlations, because those don't mean a great deal in my mind in, in, in terms of you know, managing portfolios. You sure, know, sure. Because your time frame is too short and short term correlations are absolutely unstable, notoriously, they get skewed by outliers, etc. You know, so, I mean, so I'm talking about. Uh, correlations in terms of the relative value nature of the correlation. In other words, if one is going up, another one is going down. If equity markets are going up, where is this money coming from? Chances are coming from cash or bonds, etc. You're divesting a little bit there. So there's a flow, cash flow or capital flow that's taking place, which is, in my mind, a lot more ascertainable, a lot mm-hmm. more predictable, if mm-hmm. you like. You know, And to be able to jump onto that is a lot more efficient than to be able to call it through looking at price signals. How do you measure flow? How do you measure flow? 
Okay, so we, I mean, in our case, we have a uh, proprietary kind of um, methodology and we essentially, uh, we are, I mean, without going into the details of our sure, strategy, sure. but, you know, uh, essentially we look at volatility and we look at more like the vol of the vol itself, you know, okay. so we're going into a completely different landscape altogether. It's no longer prices at all, you know, mm. and, uh, and, and we look at this acceleration of volatility in, mm. in, in the markets and we kind of, you know, correlate it to other uh, other uh, positions that we're holding and how they're behaving, and we focus a lot more on upside volatility, as in profitable volatility, you know, which is beneficial volatility for mm. us. You know, and and so our positions uh, get changed. Essentially, the portfolio is getting rebalanced on a daily basis. Uh, now it's not going up and down, up and down, sure, sure. because we're not high frequency guys, right? But what it's doing is essentially saying, okay, if there is a move from uh, the defensive assets into into risk-seeking uh, assets uh, in, in, in the quest for risk premium, then those uh, you know risk assets are going, likely to go up, and you're going to have a a dullness, if you like, in the fixed income sort of area. Sure. So in other words, there's going to be less, and we measure it by what we call a proprietary way, uh, convexity. So we say, okay, the convexity is greater in uh, the risk assets uh, and, and less so in the non-risk. So the system automatically looking for greatest convexity kind of portfolio mm. uh, will tend to essentially shift uh, allocation of weight to the ones that are uh, looking more attractive from a vol pickup perspective, you know. Um, and interestingly, that methodology through use of only one model, which is what our, our approach is, a simple one model approach. Right. We don't have a value model, momentum model, and so on, so as, as some do. Sure, sure. Um, but what happens is through tracking this changes of convexity, in a way, we find value opportunities. So just to give you an example, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, let's say you're, you've got some position in the S and P 500. It comes down, it gets sold, um, and the money. So we essentially take risk away from there, and the risk automatically gets moved, shunted somewhere else. It could be maybe another risk asset that's doing well. Uh, we don't know, but you know, typically, let's say if it was just a fixed income and equity portfolio, it would go into uh, fixed income side, right? Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, short rates to long loans. But then let's assume that the uh, S&P uh, following the sell-off, now the market just suddenly turns. So what's happening is that the convexity now suddenly turns back positive for us in the, uh, in the S&P. So now we're not waiting for a price-based indicator, a level at which to buy again the S&P. We are constantly selling and buying, right? Mm. So it's, it's kind of a relative value game, almost like between equities and fixed income. So in this case, I'm mm. assuming that it's just a two-market portfolio. So you'd be essentially as, as risk comes back on, risk on trade comes on, you know, that starts to pick up in terms of vol acceleration. So we will naturally, again, the money flows back or risk flows back again from the fixed income side onto this. So it's this dynamic that we're after, and that is a non-linear alpha. And this is, a, a for us, a, the biggest source. And, and in so much so that uh, when we describe our strategy, we say, okay, you know, what are the two sources of returns for us predominantly? One is uh, what we call the portfolio alignment alpha. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is, you know, the dynamic between, you know, markets within the portfolio. Uh, looking at convexity in different markets and just sort of automatically, and the process is endogenous, so it's happening within. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. um, we're not we are not imposing. We're not saying okay, we've got a level here to buy or a level here to, which is subjective, right? Mm -hmm. This is just automatically dynamically adjusting. Okay. So uh, that uh, kind of uh, sets the basis for the portfolio alignment alpha, and that also has the advantage, we believe that it can handle more difficult environments better. Now, we had a 
bit of a problem here uh, earlier on because we had that one indicator still. I mentioned to you that we got rid of these indicators. Now we had one indicator that was still, it was a very long-term indicator and that mm -hmm. was preventing you. So you had a hurdle to cross. Right. Whereas now it's very smooth and it's kind of, you know, it just flows without any hindrance, right? If you want to, so all we're doing is we're actively kind of buying and selling essentially. So wherever convexity is positive, it's picking up, we're going to be buying. And wherever convexity is negative or flattening out, we're looking to sell, so long as there is another opportunity there. So, um, you know, opportunity cost is, is kind of quite important for us because uh, um, when we're doing a relative value, it's always we're relating one uh, proposition with another, right? So we're saying, okay, does this look more attractive compared to that? So I'm foregoing something here uh, in order to take increase my bet on something else, sure, right? Sure. Uh, so that's how we're kind of keeping the whole portfolio on its toes and kind of constantly seeking this convexity. Do you have to, when you construct the portfolio, do you have to kind of predetermine and say these are the risk on assets and these are the risk off assets? And uh, because the, and the re yeah. let me tell you why I ask this. We have been brought up in a world, I think, where we always look at fixed income and bonds to be the you know the safe place the safe haven that's where we go to but on the other hand i would not personally at least be surprised that in the next few years we might see a complete reverse of that situation where actually equities could be the safe haven because of a major upheaval in the credit markets and the sovereign debt issues suddenly come back with much higher uh, you know, uh, speed than we've ever seen before. So I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud here. Does 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 a portfolio or, or or a methodology like that? Does it does it care? Does it care whether it's 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 one or the other as a label? Will it just pick up the 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 the, the, the changes in volatility? That's absolutely yeah, great great point, and and that's exactly the case that it does not uh, distinguish. It does not look at the labels. No. Okay, it just looks at streams of returns essentially, and the volatility on these and the uh, and the way we've kind of designed uh, for the model to identify the pattern that mm. we're looking for. Um, and it adjusts for that. So therefore, it doesn't matter if it swaps around. You know, if one <laughs> becomes a risk asset and the other becomes a defensive asset. Sure. It's, it's purely the vol itself. And that's the beauty of this, that this is, in a way, totally agnostic to that. Mm. But it just so happens that when you look at it from the other perspective, there is... Uh, the, the bigger kind of expectation, the macro kind of uh, expectation, uh, and in terms of the relationship, uh, the way it pans out between risk and non-risk and inflation, deflation sort of periods, is at the moment anyway, it is that, right? Mm. That you will tend to see that, you know, risk premium starts to enrich as inflation picks up, growth picks up. Um, and so there is a natural tendency for the system to be almost say, Hello, I mean, this is, this is, I want to belong this, and guess what? This is S&P, or guess what? This is a commodity, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but it doesn't care, you know? Mm. So it, it just identifies those where the action is happening a lot more. And, and uh, the nice thing as well is that, you know, you take a year like 2008, it was interesting because, um, you know, this was the crisis period, and, and I know that, you know, most CTAs did very well mm. uh, in, 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 in that sell-off, you know, building up to the Lehman collapse in, sure. uh, was it September, October, whatever. In our case, uh, we made uh, quite a bit of money earlier on in 2008 okay. um, through some of the commodities and, sure. and then to a certain extent equities, but more commodities really. Uh, in particular, if you recall, oil went all the way up to I think 150 <laughs> bucks and so on and so forth. Yes. And then you had this major reversal in July, mm. you know, early, early part of July or second week of July, I can't remember exactly when. And uh, during that period, uh, we... You know, again, using our dynamics that I've uh, discussed the, through the convexity uh, method, so the portfolio was aligning itself, and the alignment process came about through yes, eventually going because we were, we are uh, or we were at the time a lot more longer term in terms of the indicator keeping us there. You know, mm. uh, now it's a lot more dynamic. So 
predominantly very long term, but you know at the same time we we can be quite quick in terms of changing our positions if need be, um, and that's just simply a function of convexity. But in any case, you know, so uh, we eventually did go short, obviously these equity markets, and we made quite a bit of money there. Hmm. But you know what? The bulk of the returns came uh, earlier on from the shift into the um, uh, into liquidity premium, essentially, so into fixed income, so into short-term interest rates and bonds, and that's mm. where I made, and the dollar, okay? Now, the system doesn't know that the, it just sees a huge pickup in complexity in these, and it just moved in those kind of uh, areas. Uh, and, and that's how we were able to, you know, uh, generate uh, very attractive returns in 2008. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and so... Does the model look at pairs in any way, shape, or form? Or because I'm, I'm and the reason yeah. I ask is commodities is, is, you know, I can imagine that it's not that easy necessarily to combine, you know, it, obviously depending on which commodities you, you have in the portfolio, but commodities is a little bit difficult to pair up with something in, in a sense. Uh, the financials are a little bit easier, at least that, mm-hmm. to my knowledge. How, how do you do that? How do you mix commodities in, into all of this? Yeah, um, and uh, here in, in our approach, uh, as I mentioned, we don't like to kind of fit anything. So therefore, our basic premise is that all these um, assets are one and the same. So we use the same approach with this commodities, fixed income, or, or, or its um, um, you know uh, equities. Sure. Um, having said that, and you know, one of the kind of enhancements that we made um, uh, last September. Uh, and this, uh, when I mentioned that we eliminated the uh, the last indicator, right. uh, was to do with with exactly addressing this aspect of it. That commodities are obviously notoriously volatile and mm. unpredictable, particularly weather related commodities. You know, you, industrial commodities such as metals, energies are a little bit more kind of uh, fundamentally, and I say in a broader sure. looser term, uh, tradable, whereas uh, the, the others are kind of very difficult um, because things just change so quickly. Mm. So one of the things we identified is that we needed uh, to do a bit of a kind of an adjustment in the vol measure for commodities. Now, there was almost like you can think of it in a almost like a risk parity type of an adjustment. It's not total risk parity. It's just that kind of an adjustment, recognizing that this asset class, because commodities don't have any, you don't earn any income, right? Fixed income does, mm. you know, equities do. Um, so, consequently, it's pure sort of just price fluctuations, capital mm. appreciation, depreciation. And so, as a result, it does tend to be a lot more volatile. And so, we made an adjustment to the vol, to almost vol normalize, if you like, right. commodities with uh, with uh, the others, with, you know, with equities and fixed income. Sure. But the other part is when you ask, like, do we do pairs? No, we don't. We It's a one whole portfolio of, um, you know, instruments or time series, if you like. Sure. And uh, where we're long, and at the same time, we've got, um, you know, another bucket of all the shorts, basically. And they were okay. playing each other off in a way, but not in a paired fashion. Okay. okay? okay. But it's almost like a portfolio fashion where we're, you know, uh, uh, pairing them off. So, it, it, which is why I say, and within each, you know, it's kind of doing a relative value type of an approach, you know. Mm. It's kind of... And sp- speaking about the, the, the sort of the, the portfolio and the universe of markets, and you mentioned, we, we just discussed commodities, uh, I noticed that you offer, as far as I'm aware, uh, the same strategy, but with or without commodities. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that's a big debate, actually, because it, it's it's clear that people in the last few years who have not had a big allocation to commodities probably did better from a performance point of view uh, in in the last couple of years. I mean, what do you think is what is right or, or wrong, so to speak, in terms of should you have the commodities or should you not have the commodities? How do you view that? I think it all depends on your perspective. Like, uh, you know, our um, uh, AFP, as we call it, the Alpha Financials Portfolio, that came about through a specific request from an, uh, from a client of ours, an existing client who had already invested in the GDP. Mm. Uh, it was actually a fund of funds, and they had, in turn, uh, uh, I think, a pension um, uh, fund investor. 
who specifically um, asked if we uh, had a pure financials portfolio. So um, the request we got from our investor was that, look, you know, uh, uh, obviously they were quite happy with our um, strategy and and so asked us if we could run some simulations based exactly on the same approach, uh, sure. which we would not change anyhow for uh, another portfolio. We always tend to use the same approach. And we just took essentially commodities out. Uh, the interesting thing is that you know, people say, oh, so is this a carve-out? And I say, no, it's not a carve-out. In, in portfolio terms, in terms of labeling, yes, it's, it looks like a carve-out. Sure. But in terms of his behavior, because of the way we trade, um, the, the relative value... Tax- Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.